So welcome, welcome, welcome. We're Foundation Learning. We help students unlock their academic potential and strive for excellence. Welcome to tonight's webinar, Should I Take the SAT versus ACT? So this webinar is expected to run up to 45 minutes. We have some really great content from our two wonderful panelists, and we'll save some time at the end, looking at 10, maybe 15 minutes for a question and answers. Just a reminder that this is actually recorded, which is wonderful. And you'll receive a recording in your emails later, either tonight or in the upcoming days. Um, questions and answers, like I said earlier, there's actually a little box that you can just type, you know, your questions into. Unfortunately, we won't be able to respond to questions about every single person's particular needs, but we do um, encourage you to ask general questions and we'll try and get back to as many as possible tonight. Um, without further ado, I'd love to get started. So actually, before we even get to the basics, I'd love to let you know who you're actually. Okay, this, there we go. So who is actually presenting to you tonight? So we have Maisha, an admissions counselor from Columbia University, as well as Jennifer, an admissions counselor from Harvard University. Um, Maisha, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? other than what I just said, and then we'll pass it over to Jennifer as well. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Maisha Rahman. Um, I am a, I'm a PhD scientist working in biotech, but I did my undergrad from Columbia University and my PhD from Einstein. And I've spent many years mentoring students at different levels, whether it be high school, college, or uh, post-grad. I've been with Foundation Learning for the past year, and I've really enjoyed working with students and um, going through webinars such as these. So I'm very happy to be here to talk to you guys today about these standardized tests. And good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer White. I've been with Foundation Learning for several years now and prior was directing a college guidance program at a private secondary institution in my home state of Maryland. Before that, was running study abroad programs at a range of private universities across the US, helping students identify their best fit semester abroad program. And um, when I did my own undergraduate studies, I majored in English and East Asian studies at Harvard University, and then did my postgraduate work abroad in Tokyo, Japan. It's great to be with you this evening. Amazing. Thank you, ladies. So I will let you take it from here. Um, we'll talk about understanding the basics. Maisha, did you want to get started? Sure. Let's see right now. Okay, so first let's talk about the SAT. Uh, what does the SAT even stand for? Uh, it stands for a Scholastic Assessment Test. It's one of the most common standardized testing, probably across the world, that most people have heard of. Um, it's administered by the College Board, um, and the basic concept is to figure out how ready a student is to enter college and to assess critical thinking skills. Um, in the past, the SAT was a critical component of the college application process, whereas now it's more of a key component, as we'll talk about later, it is um, optional in many uh, institutions. And the SAT has um, two major sections. One is evidence-based reading and writing, and the other section is math. Do keep in mind that the essay is uh, no longer uh, administered as part of the SAT. And Jennifer, you want to tell everyone about the ACT? So the ACT, which um, is an abbreviation for American College Testing, it's another widespread um, and widely accepted standardized test that's used in the process of college admissions. Um, it's important to recognize that both of these tests are seen equally by colleges and universities. There's no preference among schools for one or the other. Um, historically, things might have been different, but in today's landscape, you don't need to be concerned about how will it look to the college or university, whether I take the ACT or the SAT? The thing that's most important, and we want you to be thinking through this evening, is which of these assessments is best suited for you and your individual learning style and your academic strengths. So um, the ACT is administered and it evaluates your readiness for college. You 
um, test in sections on English, math, reading, and science, and then an optional writing section. And there's the structure, the timing, the content, and the scoring rubrics differ from um, ACT and SAT, and we'll be explaining those a bit this evening. That's right. So some of these key differences include um, the format uh, uh, difference. Um, so because of this uh, variation in format, it might um, uh, you know, help your decision in whether you want to take the SAT or ACT. So the SAT in particular um, asks questions that are more evidence-based um, reading and writing, which means that you're taking time, reading through passages, going through context clues, and really trying to find the answers within um, what you're presented with. Uh, and additionally, there's also complex math problems which require different amounts of time. Certain questions will be easier, certain questions will be more challenging. Meanwhile, the ACT has uh, distinct sections for English, math, reading, and science. So as you can see, there are um, more varied subjects that are tested. And it's a little more um, straightforward in terms of not having to um, work on mostly context clues or evidence-based um, reading and writing questions. And continuing to look at the differences between these two assessments, um, it's not just a matter of content differentiating between the two, but the SAT is often um, designed to go more in depth and provide opportunities for students to demonstrate their strengths in analysis and interpretation. And um, while the ACT has a broader range of content that needs to be completed within a shorter time frame, And so you really wanna think carefully about these issues of pacing and depth when you you are choosing um, which way you want to go with your um, testing preferences. Now, many schools will offer uh, the practice SAT beginning in your sophomore year. You can certainly take it earlier um, if you want to, but many times you haven't had the math that's needed unless you're very advanced in your math um, development to be able to really successfully navigate even a practice test. You don't need to feel a tremendous amount of crunch time pressure and to take it earlier than it's offered at the practice level. Many schools will then offer the practice ACT in February or March of the student's sophomore year. And I have found it super helpful for my students to take each exam and see how they do, even without a lot of prep, as an initial um, gauge, an initial metric, of your performance and then knowing which one feels better to you either you get that clarity during the practice sessions or maybe you take an actual test um, then you're able to go on and either do self-study there's a variety of resources for that or targeted preparation um, in that area so i want to just encourage you to think about that as a, an approach and a strategy for determining which one is best for you. Sometimes we just have to try it out and see which one is a better fit. The other thing I wanna mention briefly is that um, with all of the talk that we're sharing, all of the, the points that we're making this evening about pacing and time management, um, we also recognize that many students work with a variety of learning differences. And if you do have testing accommodations that you have through your school, it's very important to know that you can request that those testing accommodations be applied to your testing sessions with the ACT or the SAT. There's a very involved process to do so. It involves going through your school, not doing it independently. Um, and you need to allow adequate time for that to be evaluated and processed and any questions to be asked and answered. But I wanna make everyone aware that that is, um, that is possible and very much recommended where you may have those accommodations in place in your secondary school. So another key difference is the scoring. 
uh, these two exams. Um, the SAT um, has a maximum of, four, of 1,600 points. Uh, that's a max of 800 for reading and writing and 800 for math. Uh, meanwhile, the, S the ACT ranges from 1 to 36. The way this works is the four mandatory section scores are averaged to give you a total sum. Now, these numbers, the difference in numbers doesn't mean anything in terms of, you know, helping you decide which exam to take, whether, you know, if you think a greater number looks better, et cetera. At the end of the day, it's more about the content. Like Jennifer said, you know, trying to take these practice exams, see what you're more comfortable with, see how the timing um, works for your schedule in terms of um, are you good at more fast paced questions or do you like spending more time um, analyzing passages, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, do keep in mind that the scoring is different and all universities are aware of this and they have different ranges of uh, scores they do expect. And, but then again, scores are optional. So something else to keep in mind is even if you do take an official uh, standardized exam, standardized test, it is not mandatory to submit your score. So if you feel that um, you did not score as well as you would have loved to, or you didn't feel that it's within range for your dream college, it's okay if you have the financial means, if you have the time and the ability to take it again, feel free to, and you will not have to submit your uh, previous scores to the college. Um, so do keep that in mind and don't stress too much about the actual score at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And here are some factors to consider and uh, that we want you to be thinking of as you are moving forward through this process. Um, we want you to be thinking of this as a personal decision where as I mentioned before, you're going to see that individual strengths and weaknesses um, play better to, to one or the other of the testing um, opportunities that you have. Um, some students will make a decision to um, say, I'm, I'm not gonna test at all. And with some schools, um, that is totally fine. Um, and you're able to do that and just you know take that decision and run with it. But most students will at least give it a shot that's why you're here tonight. And so we want you to be thinking of which is the better fit um, vehicle for you. One um, way that you can kind of assess a good um, score vis-a-vis -vis the institution that might be um, one that you're really interested in attending is to look at the range of scores that are common for students at the top 25% of admitted students, that top quartile, and see if your scores are falling at that range or near to that range so that it makes you a competitive candidate. I always laugh when I look at MIT's score range for the ACT where it's a 36 to a 36. You know, the bottom 25% of the students and the top 75% of the students are scoring the same. Um, not every institution has numbers like that, obviously. And many have a wide range of scores to accommodate a wide range of um, academic abilities in, this, in the system, in their school. And also um, making allowances for the fact that not everyone is going to test in a standardized testing format in the same way that they might perform in the classroom. So just keep in mind that this is one of many factors that goes into your um, evaluation in your college admissions portfolio. Um, many other factors are considered in your application. And at least for this year and next year, um, most schools are remaining test optional. Some are changing those policies, but for right now, that's the, the overall theme. Will continue to do so because at the end of the day um, time is really crucial when you are taking these standardized tests and most importantly um, taking practice exams to get familiar with the time um, limits for these exams is really important so the SAT does allow more time uh, per question when you average it out and the ACT um, 
basically demands quicker decision making. And that's because, like we said before, that the SAT is more evidence-based, data analysis, where the ACT is more about um, like quick knowledge. So at the end of the day, it's up to each individual student to see um, what suits their style more. But again, it's kind of impossible to really get an idea of this without actually taking practice uh, exams and not just doing practice questions, but actually sitting down with a timer and going through um, a full test uh, within the allotted um, time as you would in, on an official day. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that it's not only time management of, of regarding the actual exam, but also time management in terms of preparing, um, setting aside enough hours before you take these exams to practice, um, to do practice questions, to take practice exams. Um, but yes, at the end of the day, there is a difference um, in the length of these exams and the time you'll get per question. And another aspect that we encourage you to think through when you're making your decisions about um, which test is best suited for you is your individual test taking style. Um, so you may have um, some tried and true mechanisms that you know work very well for you um, as you're going through um, exams in your high school. And you want to be thinking about keeping those in mind, as well as stress management ideas, whether you do breath work, whether you do um, visualization, whatever it might be that you found is a very helpful add-on to your academic testing, um, that you remember to bring those in to the testing um, center with you and, and kind of as you're going through this process, you want to be incorporating those strategies as well. Some students are going to find that the SAT's um, emphasis on those complex pro problem solving skills are best suited to their individual styles, while others might find that the ACT um, and its ability to really focus in on content in a straightforward way is best suited for them. And some of my students who are very gifted in the sciences are naturally drawn to the ACT because it does have that separate standalone science section and they're like, okay, this is where I really get to shine. Um, and keep in mind that when these scores are, um, the ACT scores are conducted, you get a subscore for each of the sections that I mentioned, and then you get an overall composite score. Um, you get a super score that uh, factors in your highest ranked scores over time from the different sections. Some schools will accept a super score, a very few are more particular and, and don't. Um, they wanna see every um, testing session that a student has done and evaluate that holistic um, progression. But don't be concerned if you've had to t take the test a number of times and the school you wanna apply to wants to see all of your scores, because in general, you're gonna track upwards um, and show um, also qualities of determination and persistence which colleges really like to see. Right, so it is important to um, tailor to the college's needs. So whatever colleges are on your list, it's super important to do research in terms of what they expect to have, uh, to receive as part of their college portfolio. Um, like we mentioned before, nowadays, most schools remain test optional but make sure that you um, do check on the school's websites or with um, certain counselors or even your guidance counselor to make sure that you're up to date on the policies. Um, when it comes to assessing whether the SAT or the ACT is, is viewed more favorably by different schools, um, that usually is not the case. Um, again, it depends on, on a school to school basis, but most uh, colleges view them equally um, because at the end of the day it is an official standardized test um, and you know it, it again depends on your personal test taking style if you feel if you happen to take both and you feel that you really really shined more on one then feel free to just submit scores on one if you find that you are interested in science and you 
you know, performed very well in the science section, um, you can send that to um, the school of your choice to kind of help your enhance your portfolio. Um, but do make sure you do your college research, talk to your counselors, uh, make sure that you are up to date on the policies. And like Jennifer said, most schools do have this information um, about the quartiles, about what the top 25% of students are getting. So having as much information as you can about the school will be very helpful when deciding when to when and which test to take. Many colleges, um, as I mentioned before, really view the SAT and the ACT as interchangeable and don't have a preference for one or the other. So you should feel comfortable confident and comfortable that um, submitting scores from either test is generally acceptable. Um, there's there's really no advantage to going one way or the other. Aside from all of the information we've been sharing tonight, which is to evaluate which one is best suited for you and where are you going to shine individually. Um, I do have some students that I've worked with who are really focused in on achieving the highest score that they possibly can and really wanna achieve a perfect score if at all possible. Um, and I will say that in my experience working with my student cohorts, um, the ACT and getting that 36 has often been um, somehow a little bit more attainable for students than getting that 1600 on the SAT. The way the scoring metrics work and everything, um, many students will end up at like a 1580 or 1590 and they're really, really close, but they're like, I want that last mm -hmm. couple of points to get my perfect score. So if you're one of those students who's just shooting for the stars, you may keep that anecdotal um, evidence in mind and do a little bit of, again, individual testing and an assessment on what is the best, best fit for you. Okay, so now that we've talked about the differences, um, what, uh, what's in common is to really prepare um, for the standardized tests. So here we're talking about um, how to make a winning preparation strategy. So one of these um, important things to keep in mind is identifying your personal weaknesses and really taking the time to um, improve and focus on those areas um, and creating a study plan that will address um, those particular uh, gaps that you have in either knowledge or in skill. And by skill, that can mean, um, you know, maybe reading over a passage more quickly or advancing your vocabulary or practicing more, uh, particular type of math problem. So taking the time to understand where you feel that you could you know, do better is important and it's, it's good to focus on that so that you can see yourself improving over time. Um, secondly, time management. Again, we're bringing this up. Um, once you start taking practice exams, you're more familiar with the structure and how these questions are asked of either the ACT or SAT. It'll be um, easier to manage the time. And um, I think uh, the more practice tests you take, doesn't mean you have to take one every day for like a year, not like that, but the more practice tests you take over time, the more familiar you'll be with these exams. And same um, thing when it comes to the third point, understanding the format. Um, you'll be more familiar you know, once you do more practice tests. Um, and you, you'll understand your own pace, whether that is, you know, do I need to spend a little more time on these uh, more straightforward math questions because it's easy to make a mistake in them? Or can I kind of zoom through those and focus on the more complex questions later on? And at the end of the day, like we're mentioning, it's all about you. It's about your personal style, your personal preference. But the, the overall things to keep in mind are time management and really preparing yourself. So when we're thinking about strategies for success, um, we want to be emphasizing these three different areas where we encourage you to create a study plan, identify areas um, that need to have some focus for improvement, 
and then um, work on timing yourself because just because you can do something within a larger, more generous amount of time um, might not mean the same performance will um, follow through when you're under more time constraints. So when you're thinking about um, creating a study plan, you obviously wanna be setting goals for yourself, um, looking at when um, are the test dates that you wanna engage with, when's gonna be a good time for you, where you don't have um, as much demanding um, coursework, exams, papers due, and you have some time to be able to really focus on test prep. And you wanna be incorporating areas where you know you're already strong, with those areas where you need to kind of focus in and bring your skills up to speed. We can't all be gifted in everything. I, um, you know, we, one of the benefits of going through your educational plan is that you come to understand where your natural areas of giftedness are and where with some focused effort, you can really shine even though it might not come naturally to you. And you know that that just is gonna take some time and some practice and some effort on your part. Um, as you're looking at those areas of improvement that have been, um, you know, brought to light either through practice test or um, a regular testing session, you can really allocate your resources effectively there and focus in your efforts by addressing that that particular area. For example, to look at the SAT breakdown between. Um, the math and the, the verbal assessments. You are maybe gifted in mathematics and you know that you're scoring in the 700s already, but your vocabulary might just not be there. Maybe you're a second language learner of the English language. And so you just need to do some concentrated focus preparation and vocabulary. There's all kinds of apps. There's all kinds of test prep that's out there, um, both free and um, paid that you can avail yourself of to bring that area up so that your reading comprehension improves, the vocab sections improve, and your overall score comes up. But if you don't do that focused um, extra effort independently, your scores maybe aren't gonna be the best that they could possibly be with that extra effort. So we really do want you to spend that extra time figuring out um, what are the specific areas that you wanna address and develop, developing a plan for that. And then before you're ever really in a testing environment, we want you to time yourself on the practice tests. So you get a sense of just how quickly you need to work through the materials in order to successfully um, complete them. Some of my students have engaged um, with speed reading to try to work on their reading comprehension and build, bring their scores up. There's all kinds of strategies that you can um, uh, take under, um, you know, that you can incorporate and really um, bring your success up. Amazing. So this actually brings us to our question and answer period. I just want to take a moment to thank both of you um, thus far for all the incredible knowledge that you've shared and your expertise is very much appreciated. Um, to our wonderful audience, if you have any kind of questions, we'd love to um, we'd love to hear about them. So if you want to drop them in the little Q and A box. In the meantime, Maisha and Jennifer, I love asking this question. Um, what is the biggest piece of advice each of you have about you know whether it's um, the SAT, whether it's about the ACT, whether it's about standardized testing, just the, the your biggest piece of advice in general for students. Jennifer, do you wanna go first and then we'll sure. switch over? Sure, definitely. I would encourage everyone to think and remember and remind yourself um, to not hyper-focus on this, that it is one aspect of a holistic admissions review that's conducted by schools. And while it is an important metric um, and it's important that you do your best, there are many, many other ways that your applications for a given college or university are evaluated. You have essays, you have your transcript that reflects three and a half years of your high school performance. You have recommendations from teachers and others who know you well and can comment on not just who you are as a student, but who you are as an individual and the qualities and the character that make you unique. 
you have your activity lists that document years of involvement in organizations at your school and in your community. So while this is used as part of that evaluation process, and don't think of it and put too much emphasis on achieving XYZ score. And when I'm talking with my students, I always encourage focus on your academics first and foremost. Don't let testing and the pressures of testing or test taking interfere with that. There's plenty of calendar dates throughout the year where you can choose the best time for you that's the most um, stress-free possible and know that you can take it again and again until you have a score that you're happy with. Very well said, very well said. And I do see some questions coming in, so we'd love to see that. Uh, but we will get to them as soon as we hear from Maisha. Um, sure, I guess I would just really advise the students to remember self-care. Um, it is, you know, a stressful time. Um, I know a lot of high achieving students tend to put a lot of pressure on themselves to you know, achieve the perfect score. Um, but, you know, in that process, make sure that you're sleeping enough, you're eating enough. Um, don't sacrifice, you know, your, your sleep and your physical energy to stay up all night taking practice exams. Um, I always say before the day of your exam, make sure you kind of follow a good healthy routine so that you won't be crashing during the test or you won't feel sleepy during the test. Um, so just, just to keep in mind that self-care is important. And like Jennifer said, this is only one part of your entire application. It does not, this score does not represent you as a student, as an applicant. So uh, be kind to yourself. Always be kind to yourself. Um, so I have you see a couple of questions in here. So Delaney asks, can you share test prep resources, websites, practice books, tutors? Fantastic. Um, not to toot our own horn, but we have a ton of really great resources for you. So we have test prep resources. Our website has a ton of information, whether it's blogs, practice tests you can take. Um, and in terms of tutors, of course, that's a service we offer as well. So we have a free option for a consultation where you can actually meet with one of our counselors and you can sort of talk about a game plan and just have a really nice one on one um, foundationlearninggroup.com. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Delaney. So, Hanish, I apologize if I, I miss said your name. Um, I'm a sophomore currently, and I was wondering when is the best time to take the SAT, ACT? Panelists, what do you think? When is the best time for someone to take the SAT, ACT? Um, I would say it's good to start you know, practicing early, usually by sophomore year, you will be presented with the opportunity to take the practice SAT, the PSAT at your institution. So already that will be fantastic, um, you know, preparation. Um, if you're asking when to take the official exams, um, usually students take it around the end of sophomore year to the beginning and through junior year. Um, it is offered multiple times during the school year. So it's really up to you. It depends on your schedule. Um, you know, if you have AP exams to work around, if you have other exams to work around or extracurriculars. Um, but by the time you are in early junior year, it would be good to have uh, an official exam under your belt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think that it's important to to have that um, test score and the test taking experience um, of a real test session going into your junior year. And by this time um, in your junior year, we're starting to work on college list building. And the scoring is one aspect that we do incorporate into that planning process. Now this year, it's a little bit different for our juniors because the digital SAT obviously is coming out in March. And so many of my juniors have elected to hold off. They might have had you know, one um, test taking um, experience under the old 
model, but they're waiting until March to test in the new format. And um, but going forward, that won't be an issue. So um, definitely, I encourage you, especially with the math sections, to look at in the practice tests what kinds of math is being covered there. And part of the answer to when is the best time to start depends on where you are in your math curriculum. So you want to make sure that at minimum you've been introduced to the concepts that you're going to be testing on in the course of your academic studies in your math classes at school already before you sit down and try to take a test on them. And then you can always build up those areas if math is not your strong suit. But taking the test before you've got those foundational components um, can just be disheartening um, if you, you know, if you just haven't had exposure to that content yet. And we don't want that to be your experience. So that's the other piece of advice that I have on the timing. Fantastic. Thank you both very much. So I don't see any more questions in our question and answer box. So I think this would be a really great time to wrap up. I just want to take a moment, another moment, I should say, to thank both of you for your insights and um, just sharing your wisdom with us here tonight. And as well as I want to thank our very active audience. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, let me just triple check. Yeah, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so I will wrap this up again. Thank you very much. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and a, a fantastic rest of their week.